1 Corinthians chapter 13. We have been going through this chapter for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to stay on it for a few more weeks because there's just so much to it. And just to kind of recap, the Apostle Paul has come in contact with the church that is majoring on the spiritual gifts. They found a bunch of pride in themselves for how awesome they are spiritually, uh, that they operate in all of these different gifts. They operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, but there was a, a lot of division within the church. There was an extreme lack of love. And Paul essentially says in 1 Corinthians 13 that you can operate in all the spiritual gifts that you want, but if you don't have love, then it's nothing. It's worthless. It's of no value whatsoever. Jesus taught us this when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. He said love your neighbor as yourself. The foundation of the gospel is love. And so we have been breaking into this idea of love and what it means. And um, I just want to remind you the definition of the word that Paul uses here as love is the same definition and the same word that was used when, it, when the, the word of God says, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It is a what is called agape love. It's an unconditional love. Uh, let me just read to you the, the definition of agape love again. It says that divine, it is a divine love that gives and gives and gives, even if it's never responded to, even if it's never thanked, even if it's never acknowledged. Now, this is a challenge for us in our society because a lot of our love, a lot of our well-doing to other people is predicated on what they do for us. And many of us within our uh, inadequacies of being human, that we can cut people out of our lives who may not do for us what we feel like that we do for them. That is not agape love. It's not the way that we are called to live and behave as Christians. Agape love is a divine love that gives and gives and gives, even if it's never responded to, thanked, or acknowledged. You could say that agape love is a love that isn't based on response, but on a decision to keep on loving, regardless of a recipient's response or lack of response. Because agape is such an unconditional love, it is called the highest level of love. It is the most noble, purest form of love that exists. Paul talks about this love when he said that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up and then give to us. He didn't care whether there was a response to the sacrifice of his son or not. He so agape, unconditionally loved that he gave his son when we were lost in our sin. Amen. This is the love that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's read, if we would, the entire chapter, and then we're going to focus on a few verses in particular. It says, If I could speak all the language of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge... And if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Now, I just find it's fascinating there that Paul says you can operate in charity and benefit without being in love. Hmm. Verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. Ooh, hallelujah. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. No, love never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our no knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things." 
Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of all of these is love. Let's so the, the verses I want to uh, I want to focus on this morning is starting in verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. We're, we see here that there are 15 characteristics that Paul gives about love. And now the great thing about this is, I t- as I told you last week, is this group of scriptures is twofold. Not only is he challenging us to operate in these characteristics, but he is reminding us that these are the characteristics of God's love for us. And so not only are we challenged through these scriptures, but we are reminded of the love that has been given to us as his children. Amen. That there is agape love, unconditional love, endless love for the believers of God that have faith in Jesus Christ. And so we find out that God's love is patient and kind. We find out that God's love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Amen. We find out that it doesn't demand its own way. We find out that God's love, it's not irritable, that it keeps no record of being wronged. Hallelujah. That God does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. His love never gives up. His love never loses faith. His love is always hopeful, and it will endure through every circumstance of your life. So we have to be encouraged, first and foremost, if we're going to operate in the full love of God, we have to receive the full love of God today. I said this last week that people who have trouble giving the love of God, they have trouble receiving the love of God. That there is a disconnect that's happening in your life. If you are having trouble loving freely as God has freely loved us, then you need to examine your revelation that you have of God's love for you. Just let me use an example in my own life. I remember when people used to tell me about the father heart of God. Well, my relationship with my father was not the best. So when I would hear that, I would cringe. I'm like, well, I don't want any part of that. Well, my revelation had to be changed about what a real father is what a real father does, how a father loves unconditionally and is there for you continuously. It has taken me having my children to even understand that love even more. And as I have loved my children, I've come into more contact with with the love of God for my life. Amen. Thank God we are always growing, right? And so this morning, if there are things in your life, you're like, man, I just, I don't feel like I can love that way. Well, I would challenge you to begin to examine your revelation that God of love that God has for you. Maybe there's been abuse in your life. Maybe there's been a hurt. Maybe there's been something that's happened to you where you're like, ah, I can't fully trust that love thing because I've been told that I've been loved before by someone and that love fell through. It didn't hold true. It wasn't unconditional. God's love is. Amen. That's why we respond to him out of our hearts. That's what the Holy Spirit and his grace awakens us to his love. So be encouraged this morning. God loves you. He thinks you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. He delights over you. You are his joy. Amen. I love this truth that says God didn't need us. He doesn't need you. Right? Right? He is all in all. He is everything. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He had tons of angels before we ever existed worshiping him and bringing him glory and honor, right? He sneezes and a new universe is created. He doesn't need us. He wants us. And that is a great revelation. We should live our lives out of the truth that he doesn't need me. No, he wants me. What a huge difference that is. Because when we think that God just needs us, then we feel like he's just using us. That's not what he's doing at all. He delights in the relationship that he has with us. That's why he wants us to come into his presence. That's why he wants us to come and enjoy of him and be with him because he gets a kick out of who you are. That's why he makes all of us different and individuals 
right? That we all have our own little things that we do, our own little intricacies, our own little habits and stuff. And he just gets a kick out of it and laughs about it, right? He loves the fact that my wife is so organized and together, and I am totally not. He digs that. He thinks that's the greatest thing because he made us that way. He takes delight and joy in it. Amen. So know today, before I challenge you to live in the character of love, know God's love for yourself. Paul starts by saying love is patient. We're going to kind of geek out today a little bit on the Greek, if you don't mind, because the words here, in the English language, just don't do it justice. So we're going to go through each one of these and kind of break these down. Love is patient. That word patient there is taken from the, a Greek word that means long-suffering, something that is distant, far, remote, or of long duration. It is combined with another word that embodies the idea of swelling emotions or a strong and growing passion about something. And when these two words are compounded into one, it pictures a word that is, pa- that is the patient restraint of anger and therefore long-suffering. It can be translated in the words forbearance and patience. In other words, agape love that is being talked about here, it's like a candle that has a very long wick. And because its wick is long, it is prepared to burn a long time. It is ready to forbear and patiently wait until a certain person finally comes around, makes progress, changes, or hears what you are trying to communicate or teach them or reach them with. How many know that God operates like this with us? Ephesians says that we are his workmanship, his craftsmanship. That word there in Ephesians actually means a tapestry that is sewn together one thread at a time. Right? How many people get impatient with the process of sanctification? (laughs) It's like, man, Lord, can I really, can we move on with this issue? Can I have breakthrough in this part of my life? What's taking so long? And God reaches down and asks you, well, I was wondering the same thing. What is taking so long? But there is a process of sanctification, and God delights in the process. The Holy Spirit is here to to progress us forward. Amen? That God's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for progress. And that there is a slow, intentional process process that happens in our lives that brings us into a place of holiness. And it's that long-suffering love of God, that agape, patient love that continues with us in this process. It is a picture of a person who is, whose feelings for someone else are so passionate that he doesn't easily give up or bow out. I often think about Peter when Peter denied Jesus and Jesus went and chased down Peter and restored Peter in relationship with him. That Jesus so loved Peter passionately that he wasn't going to allow him to live in his brokenness and his guilt, but he rather went and restored Peter unto himself. It's a picture of someone who keeps on going and going and going, even though the other person doesn't quickly respond to him or her. So when Paul says that love is patient, his words could be rendered that love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. I'm going to read that again because some of you should write that down. Love patiently and passionately bears with others for as long as patience is needed. Don't turn there. Just let me read it to you. Psalms 103 describes this type of love from God to us. Verses 8 through 13 says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He is slow to get angry and failed with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Thank God for his love. And let's take it a step further. We are called to love in this same manner. Patiently, enduring. Husbands and wives, if you can work on this type of love right here, your relationship 
will get so much better. Because one of the number one arguments in marriage is that we just don't have the patience to bear with one another. That we want what we want, and we want it right now, right? I want my spouse to begin to shape up and to begin to act like I want them to act like yesterday. Not tomorrow, but like right now. You better clean it up. Have you ever said that to one of your children? Better straighten up right now. Okay, good luck with that. Okay, there's a reason that they're not adults until 18. Because it takes 18 years to get them to where they're ready to go out into the world, right? It's an 18-year progress. Husbands, wives, let's love each other patiently. Let's endure with their weaknesses, right? Let's stay steadfast in the progress that is being made in their life. And you know what? I just encourage you to find just one thing, one progress that your, your mate has made and capitalize on that. Think about that. Rejoice in that. Amen. Celebrate that with them. Hallelujah. Quit talking about all their shortcomings. And even if it's just one, right, even if it's just that they learned how to put the toilet seat down, Celebrate the fact that they learned how to do it. Amen. That you're not falling in anymore. Hallelujah. Love is patient. Agape love doesn't throw in the towel and quit. In fact, the harder the fight and the longer the struggle, the more committed agape love becomes. Like a candle with an endless wick, it just keeps burning and burning and burning for it, no, it never knows how to quit. This is, of course, contrary to our human nature, which says, I'm sick and tired of waiting and believing. If that person doesn't come around pretty soon, I'm finished with this relationship. I've talked to you about this before. It is our fast food mentality in our society. That as we are sitting and waiting for our Big Mac or whatever you might be waiting for, your Chick-fil-A, that you lose your mind if you're in the line for more than seven minutes, which you yourself could not make that sandwich at home in seven minutes. But yet we expect for our sandwich to be in our car in less than seven minutes. And heaven forbid, I'm talking about myself, that they ask you to move forward and wait. And I see car after car going by with their chicken sandwiches. Come on now. Guess what? That is an opportunity for the Lord to teach you about patience. I found it just a few minutes ago. It's so funny how we get so adapted. I was emailing that image to our computer, and I went on to get on the email, and it wasn't there in five seconds, and I was so frustrated that it wasn't there. I emailed it. What's going on? Well, the computer's like thinking and stuff. There's a process that's happening. We live in a I want it now society, but guess what? That's not agape love. Are you in a relationship that tests your patience? Are you tempted to throw up your arms in exasperation? If so, you need a good dose of agape love to be released in you. According to Romans 5.5, 5, the agape love of God has already been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. It actually says that we have been filled to abundance with this type of love. This means that you don't have to come up with this supernatural love by yourself. The words shed abroad are from the Greek word that denotes a pouring forth, a discharge, a spilling out, and something that is dispersed in abundance. In other words, God has magnificently bestowed on you sufficient love to be long-suffering in any relationship or any situation. It is there for you to tap into. You just have to choose to do it. You have to begin to release your faith. Someone say faith. See, we think that faith only has to do with finances. Eh. Faith has to do with every aspect of your life. And if you want to operate in agape, patient love, you have to begin to release faith that God has given you the abundant supply to operate in that love. Maybe you need to begin to confess it with your mouth. You begin to speak the word of God for it, saying, you know what? I don't operate in impatience. I operate in the agape, patient love that Jesus Christ has poured into my heart. Why? Because it's there abundantly, right? We begin to change the way that we speak, the way that we talk. We begin to line up our actions and our words with our faith, hallelujah, and you'll be amazed at what begins to happen in you. 
God has literally been poured forth, dispensed, and shed abroad in your heart. So when you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, he will release a river, not a trickle, not a little bit, but a river of this divine love to flow forth from within you and cause you to be supernaturally long-suffering toward that person who has frustrated you so much. At home, begin to walk in the spirit of the anointing of God. Amen. We don't do it enough. There is an anointing for you to love patiently. Amen. It's just a human fact that human nature is short-tempered and intolerant, but agape love is slow to anger, slow to wrath, and it doesn't know how to quit. It supernaturally becomes stronger and more committed the longer it takes to get through to the heart of the one who is loved. This is a miraculous love, a love that transforms and changes people's lives. When I finally got the fact that God wasn't waiting to run out on me, whew, what a transformation that happened in my life. Because all of the love, most of the love that I had experienced was short-changed. It was short-lived. They would take off very quickly. So I didn't understand long-suffering love. But when I began to realize that no matter how big of a scoundrel I was or the mess that I would get myself in, that God's grace always showed up again and again and again and would restore me again and again and again, transformation began to happen. If you want to transform your marriage, begin to operate in agape, patient love. It will change your mate. How do you know? From experience. I've shared this story before. My wife tapped into something about seven years into our marriage. And she began to walk and talk to me in a completely different way than I was behaving. I didn't deserve to be talked to the way I was behaving. I was being a scoundrel, a goofball, an idiot. But she decided to begin to build me up with her words rather than tearing me down with her words. And in that love, a transformation began to take place in our relationship that changed the way that I behaved. Ooh, this is good preaching this morning. You know, Krista would tell you, this isn't building her up. That came through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. But I can tell you what it released in our household was supernatural. It changed us. Amen. So love is patient. Number two, love is kind. Someone say amen. I love you, but I don't like you. Wrong. Love is kind. If you love someone, you do like them, and you show it. Love is kind. Paul tells us that love is kind. The word kind here is a Greek word which means to be adaptable or compliant to the needs of others. Yeah, this one's hard. So when agape is working in your life, you don't demand that others be like you. We don't need more of you. Let me just bust your ego real quick. I told you this a few weeks ago. We don't need a bunch of errands running around here. I'm not trying to make you like me, right? I'm already sick of myself. I don't need a lot of us, all right? So husbands, quit making your wife be like you. Wives, quit making your husband be like you. Parents, quit making your children be like you. They're not like you. Amen. We don't need more of you. Get over yourself. You're not that great anyway. I'm just telling you the truth. I love you. God loves you. But, you know, when we begin to think how great we are and that everybody should do things like we should do, you're getting in trouble. What did we learn not too long ago? There is unity in diversity. That the way that Krista does things may not be a way that I do things, and that's what makes our marriage work so well. Amen. Be adaptable, compliant to the needs of others. Instead of making everybody like you, agape makes you want to bend over backwards to become what others need you to be for them. It's what Jesus did. Thus, the word kind portrays a willingness to serve and to change in order to meet the needs of others. This is completely opposite of selfishness and self-centeredness. 
So when Paul writes that love is kind, it could mean that love doesn't demand others to be like itself. Rather, it is so focused on the need of others that it bends over backwards to become what others need it to be. If this is what Paul means when he says that love is kind, we must look into the mirror and ask ourselves, do I become what others need me to be, or do I demand that others be like me? Real agape love doesn't think of itself first. Instead, it is always reaching out, thinking and focusing primarily on the needs of others. The person walking in agape love adapts to those around him in order to touch them, help them, and impact them in a meaningful way. Again, let me just read this to you out of Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus said of himself, well, let me back up. He says, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over, their, over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to first among you must whoever wants to be first among you must first become your slave. Listen, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And thank God he did. That he came and gave us an example of love is kind. That he didn't come demanding that people serve him. No, rather, he came to serve other people, to give his life. As it says in Philippians that he counted being equal to God, not something to be held on to, but rather came and took on the form of a servant and gave his life out freely. Amen. This is how we are called to live, church. If we want to show the world the love of Jesus Christ, we should start by serving them. The church is really good about letting the world know what we stand against, but what do we tell them that we stand for? It's the gospel. It's the love of Jesus Christ. It's coming in and taking on the servant's towel and beginning to serve those around you. You have difficulty with somebody at work, begin to serve them and see how your relationship with them changes. Hallelujah. First of all, they're going to think you're nuts because they know you don't like them, Right? And now all of a sudden you're, you're bringing them stuff. You bring them like a coffee or something. Or, hey, can I, I'm going to the kitchen to grab this. Can I get you anything? When was the last time you asked your wife that? <laughs> I just saw a bunch of wives' heads turn. <laughs> That's all right. I'm with you there, man. I'm there with you. Can I get you? <laughs> See, yours didn't say anything. You're getting up, you're going to do something, maybe ask your wife or your husband, hey, I'm getting up, go to the kitchen, do you want something? It's something as simple as that. That is agape. Love is kind. Amen. Familiarity breeds contempt, and it shouldn't. Number three, let me go back to my scripture. So we have love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous. In the uh, original version, it says that it envieth not. The word envy there is the Greek word zelos, which portrays a person who is radically consumed with his own desires and plans. This is a person so bent on getting his own way that he is willing to sacrifice anything or anyone to get it. You might describe this person as being ambitious and self-centered. He is so consumed with himself that he doesn't ever think of the needs or desires of others. His plans are paramount in his mind, and everyone else come after him. Ooh, this is big in our individualistic culture, isn't it? That we have a plan for our life, we have something that we want to achieve, things that we want to uh, attain, and heaven forbid that somebody get in our way of that. Therefore, when Paul says that love envieth not or love is not jealous, his words could actually be rendered, love is not ambitious, self-centered, or so consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs or the desires that others possess. Say it again. Love is not ambitious, self-centered, or so consumed with itself that it never thinks of the needs or desires that others have or possess. I'm reminded of 
Uh, I'm going to finish with this one, and then we'll get the next three because I want to read this to you. John chapter 13. Verse 1 says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. So let's just stop there for a moment. Jesus is on the eve of his crucifixion, about to go to the cross, about to be tormented, brutally murdered at the hands of very evil men, a beating that we can't even fathom or come close to in our imagination, that when we see a movie like The Passion of the Christ, it breaks us so completely, but yet I even feel that it might be a little removed from how harsh it actually was. It was the most intense beating, brutal slaying that this world probably has ever witnessed. On the eve that this is about to happen, you would think that Jesus might be a little concerned with himself, right? That in his humanity, there might be a need of looking at the disciples and saying, okay, I've taken care of you guys for like the last three years. I'm going to need the next few days from you. I'm going to need you to take care of me. It's not what Jesus did. In fact, it said he had loved his disciples during his, in his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So what did he do in the midst, an hour of his need, when this crippling weight was beginning to come upon him? He got up from the table, he took off his robe, he wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet. Oh, my goodness. At a time when the disciples should have been getting up and saying, hey, Jesus, I'm going to the kitchen. Is there anything you might need? No, this weight. Now, look, come on, let's not make. He's fully God and he's fully man. He was experiencing the weight, the pain, the fear of what was coming upon his life in the next couple hours. That this weight was beginning to burden upon him, so much so that when he went to the garden to pray about it with his father, he began to sweat drops of blood See, we, we make this real pretty picture of Jesus who was just able to dance with the tulips in the clouds and go to the cross because of God and all this type of stuff. There was a pain. There was an anguish. There was a weight that was upon his life. And what does he do? He doesn't cry out, talk about everyone needs to shut up and wait on him and take care of him and pray for him. No, he gets up and he begins to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Verse 6, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Peter was moved by agape love. Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him, and that is what he meant when he said not all of you are clean. Verse 12, listen, this is the, this is the important part. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, because that's what I am. And, I, and since I, your Lord, and your teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Ooh, and how much that just reverberates throughout every part of our life, every part of our salvation. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them.